Uh, okay, guys, uh, uh, thank you very much for uh, having me here, Michael and Jan, and CLL Island. My name is Amjad. I am a hematologist. I'm originally from Pakistan. I'm from the wild west of Pakistan. I came to Ireland in 1998. I did not have any intention to stay, uh, but anyway, I got married in Galway, so uh, I can, that's history. Uh, I um, had an interest in CLL. I, actually, I had an interest in hematology as such, and that's how I ended up in in uh, in hematology. My sister is a hematopathologist, who then she works in the States, but she left. Uh, she had kids. She wanted to um, uh, give them more time. Anyway, to cut a long story short, she ended up, uh, and she's a forensic psychiatrist now. Uh, she used to have hematology books, and that's how my interest actually developed in hematology. And then when my first job here in, in, in Ireland was actually with a hematologist um, who had a different interest, but uh, certainly uh, I developed an interest in hematology then. Towards the end of my training period, uh, I guess most doctors nowadays have to have a, a tail behind them with regards to research, so I had an interest in, in CLL. And I worked with somebody who uh, was pivotal in the development, some of the prognostic markers uh, in CLL, Terry Hamlin. Unfortunately, he's no more, but uh, uh, that's my introduction to it. Okay, so my uh, I work in Galway. I'm a consultant hematologist here. And I also look after the transplant side of the uh, hematological malignancies, but only the autologous transplant, as uh, um, Ireland only has uh, one center for allogeneic transplant. Now, if I become too technical, which usually happens, uh, I'm not actually used to giving talks to uh, uh, to patient groups, so you do stop me. And if you have a question that you may not remember later on, you can stop me again. I do have a tendency again to ramble on, so you can actually stop me as well. Yeah, okay, so here we go. So I have, most doctors nowadays do have advisory roles. That's how you actually get the drugs uh, into the market. Historically, you could have prescribed anything that ever was approved. So just need to remember that a drug, a new drug that is approved by FDA and EMA does not necessarily mean that you'll get it. So nowadays, your own country has to look at the, uh, the impact, the economic impact that a drug has as compared to what it will bring to a patient and then decide in their own country whether it is worth to reimburse that drug or not. And this is nothing like chemotherapies of the past. These drugs are stupendously expensive. So while it may sound like it is unfair, unfortunately that is how it is unless somebody has a, a truckload of money and can afford everything. So the advisory role is not to fill our own pockets, uh, which sometimes is the impression that people get, but it is to get the drugs to the patient. And that is a true uh, inference that I have. So this is from uh, the person that I work with. He uh, worked actually in a very small hospital in Bournemouth, uh, but he had an eye for immunology, and that's where suddenly hematology improved. He worked with somebody in Southampton. Her name is Frida Stevenson. She's still working. Um, and another guy, David Ossier, from a very small hospital, they described some of the most important uh, features of CLL. So this was one, this is from one of his articles, CLL to mend it or be rid of it. Obviously, he missed the uh, opportunity to work with some of the newer developments, otherwise the title would have been different. So um, leukemia has existed for as long as we know, but it was only... Uh, uh, realized, I think, uh, uh, in the 1850s. But before that, people would have, and that is what led to the delay in the diagnosis of leukemia, because people didn't believe that it existed. So, um, the uh, initial description was in 1845 by two guys at the same time. He's a German physician, Rudolf Werkel, and this is John Hughes Bennett. He was a professor in Edinburgh, and they described uh, his preferred term was leukocytemia, why workers, uh, who is also known for a lot of other things, was leukemia. So there were no stains available at the time. So what they thought the white cells, which was an abnormal red cell, they call it, call it white cells blood. The first grouping was by Turk in, these, uh, in 1903, 
William Austin in the States had 80 cases of CLL, and this is where they started describing that what's the age of presentation and how it progresses and who requires treatment. Even at that time, it was recognized that some people can have a very indolent course while other people can have a very progressive disease. It wasn't, and this is not that long ago, when three people won a Nobel Prize describing the antibody production uh, producing ability of the B lymphocytes uh, or the receptor with which the B cell communicates, which was only in 1972. So it is the commonest leukemia. If you pick up books, they'll say in the Western world, I personally have doubts. Uh, in my time in Pakistan, I never saw CLL, but maybe I didn't know about CLL. So uh, it, it, it may be historically inaccurate, but I do remember they in, uh, in Leeds, they have a very big group and I think the first slide, Peter Hillman was mentioned. So there's a gentleman there, his name is Andy Rostron, who has described the, the, uh, the surface characteristic of CLL cells. And he has worked with a big hospital in Pakistan and he says it's just underreported. So there is really not that much of a difference uh, bar a bet, I guess. Uh, the median age of presentation actually uh, varies uh, from 65 to 72 and depends on who you talk to or which literature you review, but in general it would be closer to 70s. It is increasing and it is increasing because historically you would have only been diagnosed if you became symptomatic. Well nowadays you go to the GP, get a blood count, it's slightly elevated, they'll ask for further tests. So that's why uh, while the disease remains the same, the, diagno the, the, the age at which it is being diagnosed is becoming younger. It is slightly more common in, in, in men, and I think I have, so yeah, so as one grows older, the incidence increases. Um, uh, twice as common in, in men, there is a global variation, but as I said, I have doubts uh, uh, with regards to the accuracy of that uh, literature. Um, in this room, you could expect that about 5% of people, well, probably wrong wrong statement, not in this room. This is a CNL Island forum, but in general, if you were to pick 100 people who do not have diagnosed CLL, up to 3.5% of people would have cells circulating that would look like CLL, and I'll come back to that. Uh, it does have the highest familial incidence. So if you have a first degree relative, you have a, a seven-fold increased risk of developing CLL, the reason is not known. Okay, it's not certainly not an inherited uh, leukemia. There are no known risk factors. You can talk about benzenes and pesticides and all sorts of things, but in a given patient, you will never be able to find out whether there was a link. Uh, this is an older slide, so I needed to change this. This is changing, and this depends on the prognostic factors as to what the survival would be. Now, I would want to describe a few things because uh, uh, this is how CLL is diagnosed. So historically, you would have looked down the blood film, and this is not long ago. I was training in 1998 as a junior registrar where the emphasis was on uh, looking down the microscope. And if I, other than leukemia or CLL, there are 80 different or 85 different lymphomas described. And if you look down the microscope, a lot of them would look the same. So historically, 20, 30 years ago, if you had been diagnosed with leukemia, it may not have been CLL, it may have been something else. So what improved was the description of the proteins that uh, happened to form on the surface of the cell. And for that, this particular test is used, which is called immunophenotyping. So this is a patient sample. You can detect the proteins expressed on the cell surface. So you have an antibody that attaches to the protein the antibody has a label which gets when it gets excited with fluorescent uh, with a, a light of a certain wavelength it emits color that the machine can pick so you can then sort the cells into different types so this test is called immunophenotyping without this you should never have a diagnosis of any lymphoid malignancy this is an absolute must so coming back to CLL if you do that particular test this is what a CLL classically would look like. This came out of Royal Marsden, Stella Matutis, who did the immunophenotyping, and Daniel Kitowski is one of the most published hematologists, retired now in Argentinian uh, um, uh, otherwise, but lived in the UK. 
So the the B cell communicates with other cells and how it reacts to maybe uh, viruses and all that by a surface receptor, which is called B cell surface receptor, which is basically an antibody. So all other disorders, B cell disorders, this would be quite strong. CLL, this is weak. CD5 is a marker not normally present on B cells. It is present on T cells, but CLL cells evidently express it. So what I'm trying to get it is this phenotype is so specific for CLL that if you have it, it's very easy to diagnose it. And this is what I'm trying to explain. So if you look at this is CLL, mental cell lymphoma, lymphoplasmocytic lymphoma, hairy cell leukemia, follicular lymphoma, margin zone lymphoma, you can actually see that in general, if you have all these markers, it is very difficult to get the uh, diagnosis of uh, CLL wrong. So it is imperative that if somebody diagnoses you that you have had the immunophenotyping done. Um, I'll come back to the clonal lymphocytosis. So um, all malignancies or all cancers or all leukemias arise from one parent cell. Okay. So all the progeny would be the daughters and daughters and you know they would all be related. And this phenomenon is described as clonality. So all malignancies, all cancers, all leukemias arise from one clone. The reverse is not entirely true. So not all clonal disorders are cancers. Just remember that, okay? So for somebody to say that you have a leukemia, they would have to describe that they all come from one parent cell. So going back to what I said is that if you were to take 100 people and find out that 3.5% uh, uh, of the people have lymphocytes which are clonal that phenomenon is known as monoclonal B lymphocytosis so normal people can have lymphocytes which look like CLL but only very few then develop CLL and I come to that uh, so the clinical symptoms of any leukemia there are no people ask about specifics there are certain specifics but in general these are disorders that come out of the bone marrow so they will affect the function of the bone marrow which means that the patient could be anemic they could have low platelet count. Platelets are cells which help us clot the blood. So they could have a tendency to, to bleeding or bruising. Uh, they can have low white cells or high, high white cells in a leukemia, which can actually then cause um, or make them prone to infection. Because this is a disorder of the immune system specifically to deal with uh, the spleen, which is a big organ here on the left side of your uh, uh, upper part of your tummy, and the glands, the lymph glands, you can have lymph node enlargement, you can have liver and spleen enlargement. Hypersplenism is a term that we use. So spleen normally stores a third of cells. In up to the age of five, it is an organ that majorly performs immune functions. After that, it doesn't, and the predominant function is uh, acts as a big sieve. Now, it does have some uh, immune function, for example, malaria, babesiosis, uh, um, bacteria causing meningitis uh, or streptococcus so if you don't have a spleen you will be very prone to those infections so when the spleen enlarges because of any reason because it normally acts as a big sieve in that case and it stores cells the bigger it is the more cells it ends up storing so that phenomenon is known as hypersplenism which means that your platelet count may go down just because you have a big spleen um, systemic symptoms, these are known as B symptoms, which is fever uh, for two weeks, so over 38 without any infection. Sweats, these should be drenching. Okay, any other sweat is not really that important. Sweats are the least important anyway of the B symptoms, but they should be drenching. Weight loss of more than 10%, which is unintentional. Uh, again, uh, immune system. Uh, your own immune system is not supposed to attack your own cells. It is, however, not a foolproof mechanism. People who get thyroid dysfunction have hypothyroidism. It's because their immune system has affected the, their, their thyroid gland, rheumatoid arthritis, diabetes. All these are examples where your immune system becomes a bit dysfunctional. So in CLL, which is a disorder of the immune system, you can actually have these phenomena where you either destroy your red cells, which is called autoimmune hemolytic anemia, ITP where you can destroy your platelets, 
or you can suppress your marrow, which is known as pure red cell aplasia, but this is very rare. The cells that CLL uh, is derived from make antibodies. So your normal antibody level would go down because this is a dysfunctional cell which makes an antibody that is functionally ineffective. So your normal immunoglobulin level goes down and you could be prone to bacterial infections or anyone. And similarly shingles and others. Now this is what I was describing. So monoclonal B lymphocytosis historically wouldn't have been known. One could be very skeptical and Professor Hamlin was very skeptical of this thing because it causes more consternation. Unfortunately, we live in a time where you actually get the tests done by the GP. Your lymphocyte count is a little elevated. It doesn't settle after six weeks. It is nothing to write home about, but they will ask you, they will send you to get an opinion, which means that you will get a diagnosis of if it is less than five. So your normal lymphocyte count in the blood is four. Okay, so it's four by 10 to nine or four billion cells per microliter. But just remember four. So if you have persistently higher lymphocyte count more than four, but less than five, you will get this diagnosis, which then somebody has to explain to you that this could change into CLL. This is the incidence, but then you, you uh, I don't know, it depends on, on people. Um, uh, I personally wouldn't care, but I guess I, I do this all the time, but somebody else may get really affected and uptight about <laughs> it that I have a possible leukemia. But that's my own view about it. Now, the other distinction that you need to understand, so if you have a gland, enlarged gland, and your blood count is normal, and you end up going to a surgeon who would take your lymph node out, you will get this diagnosis, which is called small lymphocytic lymphoma. On the other hand, if your blood count is normal, or if you don't go to a hematologist uh, or, or a surgeon, uh, they will they will look that some of your cells are abnormal. You will get the diagnosis of chronic lymphocytic leukemia. What I'm trying to say is it is the same condition. It presents differently. It is treated the same. You don't have a lymphoma or this is not a different disorder. So the two disorders are exactly the same. They present slightly differently and they are treated the same. So historically, for any disease, if you have a disease, you want to stage it as to what, how far it has gone. Now, one thing I would clarify again, uh, the moment you use the word stage, people would have looked it up. They compare it to breast CA, they compare it to prostate CA, where if you have an advanced stage, you have a very poor outcome. That is not the case in any of the lymphomas or in CLL for that matter. Yes, if you have advanced stage, Maybe you will require treatment early or other issues, but in general, that does not mean that you cannot be treated or you will have a poor response specifically with the treatments that are available nowadays. So I won't go into the details because they are not used anymore other than maybe a trial. Um, they are supposed to be prognostic, which means that they can tell you uh, how long before you require treatment or not, but they're not predictive. So they can't actually tell you at the start very accurately what your outcome is going to be. So again, don't get too hung up on, on the staging, certainly in CLL, okay? So this was, again, this is a historical side. If you have uh, early risk or uh, early stage disease, then the time to next treatment may be long. If I just give you an example, the Japanese have a very high tendency to get um, stomach and esophageal cancer. And that has a universally a poor outcome if it's an advanced stage. So they went through a screening program where they were doing scopes regularly after the age of 40. And what they realized was that even if they found the cancer very early, the eventual outcome was not very different. So it was known as lead time bias. So these disorders depend on when you are diagnosed and that's why you don't need to be too hung up on what stage you are in, okay? This is the newer one. It is called CLL International Prognostic Index. 4,000 patients, Scandinavian countries, the um, Mayo Clinic, they looked at these patients and they came up with these, some of the newer factors that I'll actually talk about. And they divided the patient in low, intermediate, high, very high risk this is treatment-free survival. So if you have low risk, 
you have an 80% chance at five years that you wouldn't have required treatment. Okay. Um, okay, so now you're diagnosed and the dreadful term, watchful waiting, and again, I'll go back to Professor Hamlin. He absolutely hated the term because he, he thought that what it actually tells the patient is that you're going to sit there and do nothing while their disease progresses, okay? So in general, unfortunately, the term is still used, but what we actually mean is that we are going to keep a very close eye and if required, then we would be quick to jump in and do something, okay? There is historical uh, uh, precedence for it. So Mary Magdalene, Jesus, uh, Noli Mitandre, and this is from the American Civil War, uh, which was, uh, don't tread on me. Now, this was treated, this was taught historically, okay? So you see a new patient, and if it had, they had early stage CLN, you would have said, okay, third required, never required treatment. A third may require treatment a few years down the road, and a third require treatment at the start. Unfortunately, it still is okay if one is in their 70s or late 60s, and this in general still would stand true. But as I said, patients are diagnosed earlier and earlier, and if somebody is diagnosed at the age of 40, really this does not apply. Okay, so but it does actually get uh, is applicable to some people. Okay, and I can, I'll, I'll talk about this bit later on. So watchful waiting, the term actually arises from the fact is that historically, and this is not long ago, 1998 is when I started training in hematology and the only real drug available was carambicin. Historically, people would have used steroids with it, but then when I was training, steroids had gone out. They didn't really have, they improved maybe the symptoms, but not really did anything more than that. So because the treatment was ineffective and some patients never required treatment, you did not treat anyone, and I can give you an example. Uh, a, a patient of mine who unfortunately recently passed away, she was a nun, she passed away at the age of 96. She was diagnosed in 1983, and at that time the trend would have been, like any other disease, that you treated the patient. So she was given Carambacil, she got three cycles, she got fed up and told Professor Egan to go wherever she uh, wanted him to go, uh, and never required any treatment. So I first saw her in 2010, and between 1983 and 2010, she had never required treatment. So obviously the initial treatment was wrong as well, but that was the trend at the time. Um, and it, she eventually required some treatment, but her count by the towards the end of her disease was 460 or 70. And she was otherwise well, she would come in, give out to everybody else because in, in, in the outpatients because we are delaying her. So the, the issue was to minimize toxicity. Most patients were elderly, the treatment was ineffective, it had no bearing on survival, and it was based on these two which really didn't uh, uh, affect the outcome. These are the revised guidelines. Again, you don't have to, if you, so symptomatic patient, low or affected blood counts, or if they have autoimmune phenomenon that cannot be treated with the conventional autoimmune treatments, if you have a big spleen. So just remember these are guidelines, okay? And guidelines, uh, I don't know if you remember the movie um, Pirates of the Caribbean. So uh, uh, they are there to help. They are not written in stone and you can change them around, okay? So if somebody has a big spleen, which it says six centimeter below the costal margin, Yes, according to the guidelines, you should treat the patient. But if they don't have any other indication and they have no problem with it, then there is no reason to actually jump into it. So uh, while they're there, they're there to guide, okay? Uh, obviously, symptomatic patient is different, and I'll show you a slide right at the very end. Cosmetic reason is one. If you have younger patients with big lymph nodes, it doesn't really matter whether this, they, this fulfills the criteria or not. They just want to get rid of the, and stop people from staring them, stare at, at them. So if you have, this is if you diagnose a patient that does not require treatment, this would be the current algorithm that I actually follow. So you would risk stratify them, not to decide on treatment, but to see how frequently you want to follow them. So if they are low risk, six to 12 months is fine. GPs could follow patients, provided you have a GP that then it is going to follow and not leave you to uh, your own devices. So you don't have to come to the clinic, absolutely. 
uh, and some GPs can do it, others don't want to do it. Um, you should have an annual age-appropriate screening, depending on what the age you diagnosed. Uh, skin cancer is increased in patients with CLL, so I think that needs to, uh, you need to have some education about it. Um, uh, 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 risk, you should get influenza, you should get other vaccines, again, if appropriate. Um, uh, this is a terrifying complications of CLL. So uh, CLL disease that, or any other cancer for that matter, that has already acquired a genetic mutation, um, and there is a propensity in those cells that have already acquired genetic mutation to get more genetic mutation. And if it goes randomly in one direction that becomes very aggressive, then this term is used, which is known as Richter's transformation. So this is the CLL transforming into an aggressive lymphoma. Any CLL patient has a 5 to 10% risk over their lifetime to develop Richter's. And it is an unfortunate complication. Maybe uh, 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 we could do something in the near future about it. Uh, but it needs to be explained because if you don't explain this to the patient, it happens. It is a lot more upsetting. While having said that, you do take the risk of terrifying the patient before it ever happens at the start. But, I mean, that balance has to be maintained. Um, so, okay, so now uh, uh, your disease may have progressed or at the start you're presenting. Initially, you may not have all the tests, but now the doctor says that they want to do some tests. I will, uh, these would be based on the current uh, indications for the availability of treatment uh, um, and may not be internationally applicable and I'll explain, okay. So 90% of the patient with CLL who require treatment chemotherapy is appropriate, okay. And as I said, I'll, I'll come back to that. Um, the 10% have a certain abnormality that makes them refractory to chemotherapy. And they are the ones that you definitely want to pick out because you don't want to expose them to chemotherapy. And the abnormality is in this particular gene, which is present on chromosome 17. It is called TP53. It is also known as the guardian of the genome. So any abnormality in your DNA, this gets activated. It stops the cells from growing and tells the cell to repair the damage. If the cell can repair the damage, it is allowed to progress and survive. If it doesn't, then the cell dies. But if this is abnormal, then it, there is trouble for any disease. And specifically for chemotherapy, because chemotherapy affects by damaging DNA. So it damages DNA, this gets activated, the damage is too significant, the cell can't repair and the cell dies. But if this is abnormal in the first place, and if you give patient chemotherapy, you actually cause more harm than, than, than benefit. So this has to be done at the start. Historically, we did it with a particular test, and I'll show that to you, which was uh, <coughs> looking down the microscope, which is called FISH, and now molecular tests are available. So other tests at the time, it, bone marrow is not required for diagnosis. It is not required for treatment either, absolutely, but if I was giving somebody chemotherapy, I would want to know what is the pattern of involvement of their disease in the marrow in case the chemotherapy does something strange. I would want to know what their marrow looked like before I exposed them. Okay. CT scan, again, historically not required. It certainly now is required in trials. It has caused a lot of problem, but historically it wasn't freely available. Now it is freely available, so there's no big deal. You should get a CT scan. Okay. Um, uh, this is a standard battery of tests, so um, this is, these are common viral infection. Hepatitis B is important because some of the treatment can actually cause activation of hepatitis B if you had it in the past. Um, PET is the newer scan, which is a combination of a CT scan and a, a, a dye that is taken up by cancer cells. Um, uh, only if one was suspecting that Richter's transformation has happened, otherwise it has no role in, in certainly not at present. So I'll go through these tests. Um, so FISH, I explained, this is the deletion, the, the seven, chromosome 17, that is conventionally was done there, uh, 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 using FISH. This is what Professor Hamlin and um, uh, Rajendra Damle explained in 1999, and I'll come back to that. This was, so I did my PhD in CLL, and this is actually what I did my PhD in, using these four factors. This was a very, very cumbersome test, and a very difficult test. So people were finding surrogate markers that they can easily do to abrogate the need for doing this, okay? 
So this can be done quite easily now. And these two were not very good at predicting this. So some people still do it, some don't do it. Uh, Zap70 uh, in the States, one particular lab, continue to do it. Mm, uh, I don't know what's the point, but anyway. Um, uh, this is, all these can be abnormal. This is the only one that you can do, you should do, uh, and you would want to know about it. All the others are at the moment of academic interest. So fish is, uh, okay, how do I explain it? Uh, so let's say uh, one of the abnormalities in CLL is known as trisomy 12, okay? So normally you have 23 pairs of chromosomes in each cell, okay? Except mm, spams and um, eggs. So every cell has 23 pairs of chromosomes. If you look at chromosome 12, you should have two chromosomes. Trisomy 12 means that you have an extra copy of chromosome 12 and that is detected by fish so you have a probe against a chromosome 12 which has a dye attached to it and you can look at the dye under the microscope if you see two dots it's two chromosome if you see three dots you will call it trisomy 12 okay and I'll come to that now and this is the other test and uh, uh, to so as I said we did this for 17p now you can do mutation analysis okay so these were the abnormalities. Hartmut Donner is a very famous, again, German hematologist. This was described, I think, in 2000. So they, uh, in other leukemias, you would do a test which is called cytogenetics. Okay, the two are loosely interchangeable, but not accurate terms. Fish uses a different technique. Cytogenetic uses a different technique. Cytogenetic generally fails in CLL, and that's why it should not be requested while fish. There are issues with fish, but in general, I won't go into those details, but when they did, majority of the patient had this abnormality, followed by 11, 12, 17 P. So all the others are of academic interest. These four are what we use in CLM, okay? There are obviously patients who don't have any abnormality. So going from here, these are patients who don't have any abnormality, they do the best. So this is survival and this is months. This is 11 years, this is three years. So a patient required, this is when you require treatment by the way, so not a diagnosis. So the day you require treatment, and this is to do with the treatment available in 2000. Just remember that, okay? So in 2000, very little treatments were available. And if you require treatment, and if you had 17 p abnormality, the outcome wasn't going to be good. Okay, so the median survival, where 50% of the patients died, was 3 years, as compared to if you had no abnormality, where it was 11 years. So this is how it looks like. So uh, uh, you can see there are 3 green dots, and uh, the colors are irrelevant, but they look very nice when you look down the microscope. Uh, so your 3 colors means trisomy 12, 13Q, which is here, 1 red signal means 1 is deleted. Then you have another, so there are two 13Q and two, uh, three signals for 12, again trisomy 12. This is 17P, there are two dots, so 17 is fine, 11Q is mutated, and here you can see that 17P uh, in this particular cell is one signal. This requires experience, uh, but it's not a difficult test to do. Now, I'll very quickly go over this so that you can understand what the mutation analysis is, okay? So the B cell develops in the bone marrow and in the peripheral blood, in the lymph nodes. The bone marrow uh, development is without any antigen, so it just follows a particular pattern. And in the periphery, the B cell has to get exposed to, let's say, a bug in your lymph node to develop further, okay? Uh, they have different names. Uh, as the cell develops, it develops the antibody on the surface. So this is what the cell commun uses to communicate with anything else and this is the most important bit in any lymphoma or in CLL. So I'll quickly go through this. Historically, so an abnormality at any of this stage, so this is like the seven stages of human development. So if you have an abnormality in a very early cell, you will get an acute leukemia and as it go goes through, okay. Once the cell has come out of the bone marrow and it becomes abnormal, that's where you can actually develop CLL. 
okay so these are mature cells they may not have gone through antigen maturation or they may have and i'll come to that this is where the three guys actually won the nobel prize okay so our immune system you may have uh, every, you know uh, billions of genes for every bug that you will ever come across or if you look at a chessboard and you multiply the 8 by 8 and you increase let's say 2 4 6 8 you will get the number of uh, antibodies that are beyond computation so this part is where it binds the bug and there are three sets of genes in it okay and you will understand how it uh, how it happens in the next slide so these are the three sets of genes vdg okay so this is part of the antibody that binds the bug so the first thing is that randomly there are 26 genes in this family 65 in this and 6 in this so randomly there is an arrangement first between d and j then between vd and j and people would actually talk to you about mutation in the CLL, which is what I was saying, where you can have a CLL from a part which is very naive cell and a mutated cell, and the importance I'll come to. So CLL is the, or immune system is the only place where mutation is a normal thing, okay? Any other mutation is obviously uh, detrimental. So uh, this slide explains that CLL historically was considered to be a slow-growing tumor, uh, but in 1999, these two guys describe the process. So if you have CLL from the mutated genes, uh, the survival was uh, 25 years and here 8 years. So it is important to get this test done. Uh, James's does the test for us nowadays. And as recent as 6 weeks ago, they unilaterally decided that they were not going to offer it for uh, any patient, uh, we have requested them to change that for whatever strange reason, uh, but we have other choice. So I send the test to Belfast rather than fighting. Okay. Uh, so this is 8 years, 25 years, this is the other abnormality. So these two you should have done. Okay, These are absolutely imperative that you, you don't need, but just remember only when if you require treatment. They have, don't get them done at the start. Okay. Next generation sequencing, you may have heard the word, it is very sensitive sequencing. There are a number of abnormalities that are present, none of them really therapeutically at the moment important and not in, even in a given patient. Okay, Notch is one thing but uh, again nobody has changed their treatment uh, based on it. So now you require treatment and I have been offered either this chemotherapy, this chemotherapy, or this chemotherapy. So this is known as FCR, standard, I'll come to that, bendamustin, rituximab, and carambacil or benetuzumab. Uh, and maybe somebody can discuss novel treatments as well, and I'll come to that. So the history of treatment, carambacil, prednisolone in the 70s, these were UK-based trials and German trials. Fridarabin came into uh, the game uh, in early 2001 or two. Uh, MD Anderson, which is a big cancer center, they came up with this uh, combination. Rituximab was approved in follicular lymphoma in 1998. So uh, uh, um, it was added to CLL treatment. Uh, in Ireland, it was available definitely in 2000 because I was in research at the time and we were using it in James's. And we published it before other people, but because of the small number, it didn't really have an impact. Um, Bendamustin is a chemotherapy that the Germans developed in Second World War but shelved it and then became important uh, in follicular lymphoma and CLL. Um, the antibody, uh, rituximab, was the first generation, second generation was abinutuzumab, ibrutinib. And then in 2014 initially but later on 2016, ibrutinib uh, uh, was developed. So in general, as things stands, and people may argue about it, if you require treatment, you would have to stratify the patient as to how they are with regards to the age, probably not so much uh, as long as they are fit. But comorbidities and performance status would be really important. Okay, um, So if you are fit and if you have no other abnormality and one expects normal life expectancy, you can give more intense treatment. Okay, uh, If not, 
every novel agent is available. Just remember that in mind. Keep that in mind, okay? Um, uh, if you have a few abnormality or a few comorbidities, you can uh, get less intense treatment or you may just want to control symptoms if somebody is really sick. And it's unfortunately a, a, a fact of life. This is what is available in Ireland at the moment. So you require treatment. You get the deletion 17P and TP53. TP uh, if this is uh, mutated or deleted, you would need a, a, a brutinib, which is a novel agent, and I'll come to that. If it is not and you are less than 65 and fit and your kidney function is fine, you will get FCR. Now, this is a statement worth qualifying, but that is the standard at the moment. I can fast the treatment, okay? So you can give somebody a bit of chemotherapy and say they're not fit for chemotherapy and get it. But it shouldn't be that way. It's common sense should prevail and unfortunately it doesn't prevail, okay? Uh, if you're not fit uh, or if you're more than 65, uh, then you should get bendamustin rituximab if you're more than 65, less than 75 and fit. Otherwise, trambecil and obinutus. But these treatments are still valid, but I'll qualify that, okay? So these are the indications for the new treatment. So chemotherapy, I'll come back to. Um, a brutinib, uh, it is available at least one prior therapy or if you have 17p deletion. So you can't use it up front unless this abnormality. Idilalacib, good drug, lots of toxicity, will only be used later on. So I won't talk much about it. Venetoclax, we have used it in trials, but it's available if you have 17p and are either unsuitable or have failed uh, uh, either ibrutinib uh, primarily and or uh, idlalacin. So FCR is a chemotherapy, fludarabine cyclophosphamide are two chemotherapy drugs with an antibody. Uh, Ofatumumab is off the market now. Uh, second generation is obinutuzumab, it's again a Roche drug. And oblituximab, they, the, the difference is how they bind to the CLL cell. So the antibodies against an antigen expressed on CLL, which is called CD20. So these antibodies work against that antigen and destroy the cell. So this is what became famous by the term magic bullet, one of them. Um, so FCR has remained gold standard uh, for patient under the age of 65. Uh, again, not including the novel agents. Um, over 65 bendamustin and over that grambacillo uh, and I'll go through some of the evidence with you but I won't spend too much time on the squiggly lines okay as my nephew who is now in medical school in the states decided to say last year he was here doing some attachment with us so this was the MD Anderson data for CLL patient treated with FCR this is the German data uh, as FCR versus FC and the top line is FCR and this is again German CLL trial, trial with FCR versus BR. FCR comes on top all the time. Okay, so if somebody gives you chemotherapy and you can take it, this would be a better treatment. This is one of the most important slides. So this is again the same FCR 300 patients that were treated in MD Anderson starting 2000. Okay, so the tar red line is the one with the mutated genes. And this is the unmutated genes. So no relapse after 10 years. This is nearly 55% of the patients. So if you have mutated genes in your CLL and you get FCR, a chance after 10 years that 55% of the patients could be cured. Okay, you have to compare that to a drug that you have to take every day with side effects. So I would still believe if you look at the, the American guidelines, NCCN guidelines, they have a different say on it, okay? Now, there are many people who decide what comes up in the guidelines. And I personally know that one quarter of them did not agree with their own guidelines. So this is still worth considering, okay? If there are unmutated genes or mutated genes and uh, 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 bar one particular type. If you have mutated genes and there is no detectable disease by sensitive methods, there is nearly an 80% chance at after five years that you would have no detectable disease. So that is the best outcome. So mutated genes, undetectable disease and no 17p, <coughs> I would still say that if you can take the drug that FCR would still be a good choice. 
So what does MRT means? Everybody uses the term MRT. So if I look down the microscope, I can identify one out of 100 abnormal cells. Now I can probably be a bit more sensitive if I spend the entire day looking at the microscope, which nobody does. Um, flow cytometry and fish are more sensitive techniques. So if you do immunophenotyping, you can detect one in 10,000 cell by using a, a freely or commonly available machine. Okay, so if, so let's say this is, I say that the patient is in remission, they still have close to a billion cells. So this is MRD flow, so then one in a hundred thousand cells. And this is next generation sequence, because the deeper a negativity that you get, the better the response is. Now, th this is another chemotherapy uh, trial. So historically, I told you we used to use Corambicil, which was pretty ineffective. But if you just use a different, uh, add an antibody, the outcome is actually much better. So, I mean, if I was 80 and if I wanted to get treatment and if I had mutated genes, which I'll come back to, it is still worth considering that particular treatment because it's short treatment and it's pretty much, you know, not toxic. So, um, uh, if you get chemotherapy, the, the symptoms resolve very quickly. Now, this is from Nitin Jain. He works in MD Anderson. Uh, this is from the 2018 American Society of Hematology Ash Education book. I've just gone through this. So, you require treatment. You look at age, comorbidities, fish. If you are less than 65, 70, and if you have IGVH mutated, you use FCR. The question is whether you change to a brutinib or not. Okay. If you are unmutated, I totally agree, FCR should not be used, but we are not allowed to do that. So we still use FCR in those patients, but I think it should be a brutinib, which is a newer drug. Older patient, this is a plus minus, and I, they are, he is not doing the mutation analysis here. I would still do the same thing because even in trials that I'll show, if you are mutated, you still could get away with tiny amount of chemotherapy and not have to take a drug for the rest of your life which is the issue with the uh, brutinib. The question now is with the newer drugs, and I'll talk about the venetoclax and the newer antibody, whether they should uh, come up front, uh, which is this bit. So the alternatives. Uh, so what is, so as I said, chemotherapy is what we use. So what is challenging uh, the chemotherapy? So CLL cells have to touch base in the lymph node for them to survive. If you take the CLL cells out and put them in a petri dish with all the growth factors, they simply don't survive. So they require that survival signal in the lymph node, whatever that may be. So if you attack those survival signals, you can kill the CLL cells. So this is the antibody at the surface of the CLL cell, which I explained, the immunoglobulin molecule. When it engages anything, a survival signal goes through these all different, these are on-off switches. Okay, so if the cell requires a survival si signal, it switches this on, switches this on, then the switch is off. So it happens very quickly, milliseconds, okay. So um, uh, if you engage this, survival signal happen and the cell survives. Ibrutinib is a drug that specifically inhibit. These are not, by the way, these can be, but in general, in CLL, they are not mutated. They are not abnormal, these on-off switches but they are preferentially used by the CLL cells to continue to grow. So ibrutinib will stop this one, idelalacib will stop this one. And the survival signals, once they are switched off, the cell dies. Ogden Bruton was a physician, 1908, 2003. He described a disease called X-linked hypogamma globulinemia in kids. Uh, so it was a sex-linked disorder. This was one of the bubble boy syndromes. Uh, a long time later, when the tyrosine kinase was named, it was obviously named after him, and then it was described that CLL uses preferentially when the drug actually came on the market, which is ibrutinib. So this is what how ibrutinib works. This is a, uh, um, a, a, a scan of a patient. This is pre-treatment. This is post-treatment, and these are all lymph glands. This is an enlarged liver, or uh, sorry, spleen. So once two months later, you can actually see that that mass is gone and the spleen has shrunk in size. So it's a very effective treatment with not a lot of, at least in young people, side effects. 
But what it does is that it initially your white count if it was 20 and you start the patient on it within the first one two months the white count actually rises and can r r have a very dramatic rise. That does not mean that the disease is progressing which historically when the trial was started this became a problem at the time. Uh, so in older than 65 so what is changing the paradigm there are four trials which have recently been presented in the older than 65 and one younger than 65 and I'll briefly go and just concentrate on the red line. So this is Resonate 2. This was the first trial in treatment naive patients. Um, uh, CLL over 65, no deletion 17P. They were given either a Brutinib or the standard which was Clorambacil at the time. Okay. This is uh, at 24 months when the data was analyzed and the progression free survival which means that you uh, your disease still remains in remission and hasn't come back. There is no comparison. Ebrutinib is way superior to your clorambicil. Okay. Now people have argued that clorambicil was such a bad drug. So this was only to get the drug approved. But it still goes without saying that it's a very effective drug. So this is a five year uh, then uh, follow up. That was 24 months. The same. There is a massive separation between the lines. Ebrutinib is far more effective. This is overall survival despite that there was crossover. So if I got carambicil and I progressed, I had a, a, the choice to go on to ibrutinib, which means that that would have reduced the efficacy of ibrutinib, at least in mathematical terms, but despite that it was effective. So this is the Alliance trial. This was presented last year at American Society of Hematology. This is from the Ohio group, which has a lot of work. This is Jennifer Wyeck's star slide. So here, bendamustin rituximab versus ibrutinib versus ibrutinib rituximab. This is bendamustin rituximab. So ibrutinib or ibrutinib rituximab is far more effective than the chemotherapy. Even in patients with 17p deletion, these two were far better. But you can actually see that ibrutinib or ibrutinib rituximab lines are superimposable, which means that rituximab doesn't add anything. So you don't need to give rituximab. This is what I argue about and most people wouldn't, that if you had mutated genes, actually six months of bendamustin rituximab did equally well. So you shouldn't throw it away, at least it's in a certain group of patients, okay? Uh, side effects, again, I, in trials, if you're looking at trials, they'll all talk about grade three, four, and five side effects, okay? Okay. okay. <laughs> and, <coughs> Another trial, uh, this is ibrutinib or benetuzumab, clorambacil or benetuzumab. Again, ibrutinib is better. And again, for high risk patient, it is better. Side effects, ibrutinib has some particular side effects with regards to cardiac. So it causes atrial fibrillation, and which is an abnormal heart rhythm, which has its own risk factors. It can cause diarrhea, arthralgia, bruising as well. Um, but this, this would be the important one. The only thing is that they tend to put grade 3 side effects, abrut uh, uh, atrial fibrillation, which I'll come to. Um, so ibrutinib, what do we learn from these trials? That ibrutinib is better than chemotherapy, okay? Venetoclax is the new kid on the block. So this is the breathing mechanism of the cell. There are mechanisms in the cell that can actually disrupt this. And those proteins are known as BCL2 dependent proteins or the BCL2 family of proteins. So there are proteins that can kill the mitochondria and there are proteins that save the mitochondria. Okay. So BCL2 is the savior while BAC is the disruptor. And there are quite, you know, a few other uh, uh, um, backbound proteins as well. So if you have BCL2, which the CLL cell has a lot more, it will not let the cell die because it just soaks the, 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 the protein that can kill the cell. Okay. So now you have venetoclax that can actually stop the BCL2 from working, which means that this protein, which can kill the cell, attaches to the mitochondria and kills the cell. Okay. So venetoclax stops BCL2 from working and allowing the cell to survive and kills the cell. Uh, it is licensed in Ireland for these 17p abnormalities when BCRI has failed. We can't use it upfront bar trials. Okay. 
it is a dangerous drug if you don't give it in CLL in a particular way. So week 1, 20 milligram, week 2, 50, week 100, 200, 400 is the maximum is the uh, uh, eventual dose. Tumor lysis is the term where you give one tablet and your whole CLL just disappears. It has to be flushed through the kidneys. So you need to be very careful about it. And if you have a high white cell count over 25 or a mass over 5 centimeters, you will end up being admitted in the hospital. So this is how we work it out. It's not an easy thing because we can't, we don't have beds to admit patients. And it, I had CLL 13 trial. We took part in it. I ended up keeping the patients six weeks in a hospital. Most of the time they weren't doing anything because we couldn't readmit them. Um, I've just gone through this. So this was a German trial where they looked at venetoclax or benetuzumab versus obinutuzumab chlorambicil. Venetoclax, again, far more effective. And I'll jump to this one again. So if you have uh, even chlorambicil or benetuzumab, if you got this and you had mutated genes, it was equally effective to venetoclax, okay? So that one bit you don't need to forget about. Overall survival was no difference, but this was short follow-up. Predominantly, it can cause uh, diarrhea as a side effect. It can cause neutropenia and thrombocytopenia. Um, again, very effective drug, primarily used in, in relapse setting, uh, is being used in upfront setting uh, to, uh, the particular term is time-limited treatment. So ibrutinib is a continuous treatment. And it has its own demons if you use it con continuously. If you combine it with venetoclax, you may reduce that term to, let's say, a year or two years and have a far better outcome than continuous treatment. So this is FCR against a brutinib rituximab in treatment naive patients. This was presented as better and maybe it is better, uh, but it has uh, its side effects, which is a brutinib uh, hypertension and all that. And I'll bring you back to this one that if you have mutated group, you could still do with the FCR. Um, People have this against FCR that it's quite a toxic treatment and uh, it can cause uh, malignancies. Second malignancies by nature are common in patients with CLL, no matter what you do. If rutinib disrupts your immune system, it has roughly a similar, this is from German data, and you can see if anything, there are slightly higher incidence of malignancies if you take continuous ibrutinib. Okay, so if somebody is trying to sell you the drug that way, it is probably unfortunate. Um, Okay, uh, nobody mentions grade two side effects. Arthralgia is actually grade two, is described in the criteria for toxicities that it limits your activities of daily living. Similarly, diarrhea. Some of these are can be controlled and managed, but you need to see a person who is, uh, uh, who knows what they are doing with regards to the prescription. Okay, so uh, bleeding is an issue with it, and I'll skip these in. Um, this is an important slide as far as I'm concerned. So this is again in patient with mutated CLL. Uh, and what they did was that they uh, used fludarabine cyclophosphamide from FCR, but they changed the antibody and they added a brutinib. Okay. After 12 months, everybody was totally and completely negative disease in the marrow. And it is only three cycles of chemotherapy. And this is 42 months overall survival. It's a straight line. So can we achieve the same by non-chemo approaches? Possible, but we would need to wait for long-term data is what I would say. So we don't need to dump everything. And again, you need somebody who knows what they're doing to pick the right treatment for you. So this is my algorithm where if there is a fit IGH mutated patient, negative for 17P, I would still consider a clinical trial, but I would wear towards uh, FCR unless a brutinib was available and somebody can convince me that I can combine it with something else and use it for a shorter period of time than lifelong, okay? Um, if it is unmutated, I would not use chemotherapy if I had the choice. At the moment, I don't. Uh, so still consider clinical trial, but I would want this to be made available to us. In older patients, again, you, you, the older patients, while they can't take chemotherapy, they actually can't take the other drugs either. So the older you are, an 80 an 80 year old with these novel agent, agents, their six months discontinuation rate is about 50 percent. So um, I, if you had FCR and you're elapsed, this needs to be done again. Um, I will. So no 
role for chemotherapy in general for relapsed patient and it is fair to say that there's no, uh, uh, that you need to retest this okay transplant some people may ask about transplants uh, I, if I'm allowed to quote Professor Hamlin again it, it, it is like Marmite so I have two patients one of them you would actually when he comes to the clinic he had a transplant 15 years ago and you would think that he's accompanying somebody else and he's not the patient the other patient would break your heart he has so many side effects. He has survived, but with a very, very difficult disease. So Professor Hamlin used to say that I wouldn't send uh, my mother-in-law for a transplant. And this is allogeneic transplant. So while it is effective, it can cure people. There is a lot of side effects with it. And more or less people don't actually send patients to it. Um, okay. So uh, last two slides. So nothing is written in stone. Chemo free for me is a marketing ploy. You still need to use your head and get the right treatment for the right patient. Uh, FCR does have unmatched results, but other treatments are coming. And if I was given a choice of using a brutinib or a related drug with venetoclax, I think that would trump for me. But at the moment, in mutated patients, I would still use that. Thank you very much. And this was the last slide. This was an 86 year old lady who uh, resisted even coming to the clinic for a very long time. So when I first saw she had a, um, a, a scarf and she was wearing a jumper, so I couldn't actually see. I saw the chest x-ray and um, okay, this is being recorded, so I wouldn't say it. Um, uh, 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 but these are all glands. These were down here. Okay. And the neck was out here. Now she was relatively asymptomatic. She got a test dose of abinutuzumab. So abinutuzumab antibody is given as 100 milligram test dose on day one. And if you don't get a reaction, you get 900 milligram on day two. She got a test dose. And two days later, she had no limb plans. It all disappeared. So these are effective treatment. But at the same time, one needs to be very careful. She has never required treatment again. She ended up in ICU because all this blocked her kidneys and survived. She still comes and thanks us a lot. And I keep joking with us that we, you know, you're thanking us for nearly getting rid of you. Uh, but, uh, you know, so each patient is different and you have to make sure that you get the right treatment for them and educate them. And certainly, I think Louise is going to talk about it. We significantly lack support with regards to uh, in our cancer centers uh, where uh, uh, patients require a lot of support. Um, we come and go, the nurses do most of the work, uh, but we need support for the patient and their families to get them through a very difficult period initially. And I mean, I, I was corrected long time ago by a relative of mine where I said, yes, I can understand. And, and she said, um, if you haven't had it, you can't understand. So uh, uh, the bottom line is we may have an understanding, but this is teamwork. It requires a lot of support. Thank you very much. Okay, well, I see hands up already. That's great. Saves, saves me having to talk. You know, that's... <laughs>
So when again, when I was training and uh, uh, FCR became available long before uh, uh, MD Anderson had ever published, even as an abstract in any of the journals, what we find out was in our own uh, 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 Irish cohort was that the first two patients that we gave FCR to nearly ended up in ICU for a different reason, and that was toxicity to rituximab. So thereafter, what we decided was that it doesn't really matter what their count is, we weren't going to give them rituximab up front. So we used fludarabine and cyclophosphamide in cycle one, and then we went on to use rituximab in the latter cycles. Now, at the time, there was it wasn't really known that it can be significantly toxic to patients over the age of 65. So we gave it to patients over the age of 65 and 70, 71, and none of them could actually tolerate beyond three cycles. Now, the immunophenotyping uh, was just coming in to look at the disease that uh, was still uh, um, uh, present in the marrow. And what we decided at the time was that if we gave somebody three cycles and their disease was negative in the marrow, we will stop the treatment at that stage, which is what the uh, the the MD Anderson guys are now using. So I'm not actually sure. So have you done the mutation analysis or? In Ireland, it is not available uh, uh, to. So let's say if, if there was unmutated, I would probably not use it. But if you have mutated genes, I would still think that FCR would be the right choice for you. I, I think I'll just add from a point of view is that um, we felt when we, we started out is that you need this information. And the doctor's fantastic presentation, but and very scientific, but we can't move away from the science of it. If you understand your enemy, you can attack it. And that's what all this is about. But you need to know whether you're mutated or unmutated in simple terms and face and treatment. And you need to know your prognostic markers and all that. So that's, that's just my point of view. Uh, no, there's no need to uh, do any test as long as you're responding. So with regards to whether you can stop the treatment or not, uh, if you have no side effects, nobody is going to stop it. So the evidence from whether stopping the treatment is going to bring the disease back or not is anecdotal and is from patients where the treatment was stopped because they couldn't continue because of side effects. So there are patients with TP50 mutation who would have stopped treatment and would have not relapsed again. But in general, the consensus is because of the lack of information in a randomized fashion that if you don't have a problem, that you would continue to be on a, br a brutinib. The, the argument is that the longer you stay, the stress of the treatment on the cells may make the cells develop another abnormality and you become refractory. Now, the patients who became refractory to brutinib uh, uh, developed an abnormality where a brutinib binds and is that's the reason it's effective. Now, initially, the impression was that, oh, it's a brutinib that has actually caused a survival stress on the cells and they have then developed this abnormality and it is now bypassing a brutinib. When they looked deeply in some of the patients, they already actually had that abnormality even before they were exposed to a brutinib. So uh, as far as you're concerned, uh, unlike chronic myeloid leukemia, where there is evidence since 2001, and while we may stop the treatment now, you would be very apprehensive in stopping the treatment. So if it's working and you don't have a problem, you know, you could do an MRD, but nobody is going to bet their life on it that if they stop and your disease and the issue with some of these treatments. So if I give you the analogy of chronic myeloid leukemia, where the treatment, which was the first magic bullet. So initially it was so if you are totally negative for two years, there was some consensus that you can stop the treatment. 50% of the patients progress when you stop the treatment. 90% of those who progress when you come off the treatment 
will re-respond to the same drug. 10% won't and they won't respond to anything. So it is like taking the breaks off a tiny population of cells that could be very significantly abnormal once you come off it. But this is all theory. So as I said, if you were my brother, uncle, uh, I would say to you, stay on it. Yeah. Has anybody any more questions? We'll finish this up. Oh, sorry. So I uh, sh uh, went quickly over the slide. So yeah. the side effects in an allogeneic transplant are classified as acute graft versus host disease and uh, chronic graft versus host disease. So uh, the original transplant, again, were done in chronic myeloid leukemia, okay, in humans at least. Um, and this goes back to early 90s or early 80s, actually. So they developed a lot of side effects, which scientists realized that this is the immune system from the donor that is causing it. So they took the immune cells out and did the transplant. And they immediately realized that when you take the immune cells out, the effect of the transplant actually goes down. So the cells are important. It depends on how many and it depends on how you match it. But still, nobody can absolutely predict, yes, if, if there are mismatches, I can tell you that there is going to be a higher side effect. But if you get a transplant and I get a transplant and we are fully matched, the physician will not be totally able to tell you who develops the side effects. The acute graft versus host disease, which happens within the first 100 days, in chronic uh, malignancies such as CLL is about 45 to 50%. So you can say that you can get over it, it's only 100. But the long-term chronic graft versus host disease is 25 to 30%, which is way too high if one develops for having a, 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 a I guess, say a, a decent life. So this is what I'm saying that, and that's why, because other drugs are available, uh, which is venetoclax and other drugs are actually coming that people have shied away. But let's say if I had a 25 year old who has uh, gone uh, 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 and used a brutinib and has progressed and has TP53 abnormality, you would consider it. But what you may consider now is instead of doing this transplant, you may have heard of the, the term car -T's, so which is the newer way of uh, treating cells where your own immune cells are modified and given back. This is the treatment that is approved in acute lymphoblastic leukemia and is $475,000 per patient when it becomes available. So that could be considered, but I mean, they, they come down and as time passes, they may be available, yeah. Okay, I'll just last two. Last two, okay. Um, uh, unless it is compressing on the nerve that actually supplies the hearing. Uh, or is closer to up here where the uh, uh, the hearing tube is not really um, it can affect if you have glands in the in in uh, in the neck so the middle ear is connected to your throat and that's why when you get a sore throat your ear gets blocked so if the node up there is blocking that that hole that is connecting your mid middle ear which equates the pressure in the middle ear then yes it can affect but it's not a hearing loss at such it is more a mechanical thing glands anywhere unless they are so for example if you have a gland close to kidney or the tube that is taking the urine out ureter then even a small one could be significant because that could have an impact but otherwise they don't really obstruct anything in the chest if you have big glands here they can affect venous return so it depends on the site
Uh, not really. So lenalidomide is a treatment that we use uh, or have historically used. Um, in CLL, it's not an upfront treatment. And lenalidomide can cause venous occlusion, but not CLL. So even if your count is very high, CLL does not cause hyperviscosity. So not a direct relationship, no. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much.